Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with William Sperling, CEO of Child360. Bill has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Thank you. I love the name Child360. It's mm -hmm. this sort of this whole child approach, but also people surrounding the child. Talk about how you approach the work that you do and, and, and describe it. Yeah, thank you. Very insightful that you mentioned that uh, because the Child360 name really does try to encapsulate that, that, that dynamic. So we know that families have an impact on children, parents, caregivers, um, people who are professional caregivers and those who are maybe friends and family, uh, school systems, um, family child care homes, they all impact the care and education of children zero to five. What we do is we try to work within that system to increase people's capacity to care for those children in a way that gets them ready for school. And so we know that if a child is ready to learn by kindergarten and first grade, the chances that they'll be reading by third grade, which is the big indicator, are much higher. If a child's not reading for comprehension by third grade, some really terrible things happen. And so our whole focus is try to get that child with working with the, the elements in that system to get that child ready for school. The thing I like about the mission I think, and the way you describe it is that you actually have a very discreet, very simple metric. It's, it's getting a child ready to read by third grade. But then how you do that is much more complicated. It isn't just uh, one solution for every child. Talk about how you approach the work of getting different children with different needs ready to read. And that's the key. Um, the K-12 system has a little bit of a more systematized approach to how they judge outcomes for children. But when you're talking about infants and toddlers and kids zero to five years old, which is our focus, it's much harder to talk about measuring child outcomes. And you don't know what a child needs. You find out what a child needs as you provide the child with support but you're, you're in the process of providing support and then adjusting support in real time. That's right. We talk about getting the child ready for school, but also the school ready for the child. And so that's a, a, an art form, really. And so what we do is we take a very consultative approach. We have coaching and training and technical assistance for the teachers and for uh, the caregivers because each child does present a unique situation. And if, as the caregiver, you know what to look for, the earlier you can see that there might be some speech therapy or some physical therapy needed, or something in the way that you interact with the child, it can have a huge impact. And the earlier you do it, the greater impact it will have. The child's brain is 85% developed by age five, the architecture of it. And so if we can have um, the folks who are developing those brains, from parents to teachers to caregivers, um, we can have a major impact on that child's life. In terms of the different requirements that children have, there are children with different learning uh, abilities and what are described as disabilities, but they're just learning differences. Right. Um, you have children who are within families uh, where English is not the first language. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, issues in terms of, of uh, children are undergoing stress. Talk about how you try to remain aware and how you, um, you shape your initial interactions with children and their families so that you are generating the intelligence so that staff can, can create a tailored plan. Right, and that's the key, um, is the staff, the early care and education workforce is really all over. Um, so so the, how does intake, yeah, intake yeah. occur? So we don't actually run any of the preschools or any of the early care and education right. centers. What we do is we provide what I would call sort of workforce enhancements. Mm -hmm. So when our approach is we go to the site and we see what is there, we see what is working. It's a positive uh, attribute, a working from strengths right. consultative approach. Um, process consultation is what we use. And what we do is we work with the teachers and site directors to understand what their goals are because they know best and they know the, the population of kids that they're typically serving. Right. And then our experts who have years in the field and have run sites and, and centers themselves or come from family child care homes themselves running them, they have best practices that they can provide to the site directors, teachers, parents, families about how to identify issues or how to deal with issues um, specifically with, with that child. Rather than a cookie cutter approach, which is here's what works, go do this. It's 
here's what you can look for, and it's an ongoing relationship. So if the uh, provider or the teacher has questions or needs continued support and development, folks like us who provide this type of support are there for them. So you're primarily coming in on an on-call basis. People are, are coming in and they're saying to you, or you approach them with an offer of support, and then the support that is required is defined locally. That's right. We are really um, funded primarily in a public-private partnership. So we're the private, and then the funding come most, comes mostly from public agencies. So our partners include the California Department of Education, Los Angeles County Office of Education, LAUSD, um, First Five LA, First Five California. There's a lot of large um, organizations that are looking at what I'm calling the Delta, which is we know that the ECE workforce is doing this incredibly important work, but where we're valuing the workforce is really low. We don't pay them enough, we don't support them enough, and they don't come out of the systems that is, are certifying them really ready for some of the challenging populations. So our nonprofit is designed to address that delta. We don't do it alone, we work with partnerships um, with those organizations and even many more, but that's really what we're designed to do is really empower that workforce so that they are consider themselves brain development professionals, human development professionals. As the executive director of this organization, how do you shape the competencies in your staff to address that type of need? How do you select those competencies for yeah. integration into your workforce? We're pretty selective. Um, and so what we do is we look for people with um, a long track record of proven success, but who also- And what kind of success are we talking about? Yeah, successful running programs, success running classrooms, success in the early care and education field. So you're basically bringing in people who will function as consultants to people who are on the front line. Exactly right. Yeah, we almost consider ourselves something of a consulting firm. So the competencies that are required are people who have been there, done that, uh, overcome those issues, but also have a track record of success within those particular environments. And that's right. And are uh, dedicated and um, committed to continual learning because the field is always moving. So even if we think we know what is best practice a year or two ago, it may change. And so we want to be on the forefront of that. And we have a research and evaluation department which makes sure that our interventions are having the impacts that we want and that we're, we're ahead of the curve in some instances um, to make sure that we're providing this type of support to this workforce. Now, in terms of the support that you're providing, you're providing, I guess, uh, two different types of essential uh, services. Mm -hmm. The first service is a mentoring. It's a knowledge transfer. It's, right. it's, it's trying to help uh, convey to others the experience that one has developed in their career. But there's also the whole issue of, as a consultant, uh, trying to deal with today's problems. Mm -hmm. It's basically troubleshooting. Uh, talk about how that interaction actually unfolds. So from the first point of contact all the way through to a partnership with a particular class, a particular school. Right, so the intake as we call it, or the first initial interaction is really critical. We like to do it in person. Okay. Um, there are opportunities to do this um, remotely for regions or geographies that are hard to get to, but we always like to have at least the first in person. And if we can continue in person, that's great. It's like any other consulting relationship. You want to first create the connection. Later on, perhaps you can do a little bit distance if it's if it's logistically better, but but, there's nothing like this, right? Exactly, you have to have that connection. You also have to see the environment. Right. Uh, a video just doesn't capture it. You have to see the kids in, in the classroom. And we have a couple of diagnostic tools that we didn't develop, but we use, they're industry standards, that can help shape the, uh, the, 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 what we call our quality improvement plans that we develop with the teachers and the site directors. And those diagnostics look at child interactions and the physical environment as well. So we take that 360 approach to see the teacher-child interaction, the environment that they're in, and we really work with the teacher and the provider to say, here's what the diagnostics showed. Um, we've got some uh, chance to improve here. We've got some chances that you're doing great at here. We want to acknowledge that, to, to, to say that, but here are some areas where we can improve. And then they co-create the goals, and they say, here's what we'd like to do to move forward. So the first step is orientation. Mm -hmm. The second step is diagnostic. Mm -hmm. And the third step is an improvement plan. That's right. That's right. And then you also referred to the whole issue of uh, metrics and, mm -hmm. and creating that feedback loop. Talk about that. Yeah. So the metrics we like to create um, are uh, growth metrics. So personal growth metrics, metrics for the staff that they can see that they're, that they're improving and making sure that they see that the effort they're putting in makes a difference. Now, at the end, there are childhood outcomes that 
are measurable, not necessarily by us, but by others who are DRDP, um, which is a diagnostic that measures child's pro ch children's progress, those, we believe, will be impacted by the work that we do. So um, it's integrated into the child outcome as well. How do you know that you are successful? How do you know that, although you might have positive metrics in terms of the evolution of staff, mm -hmm. how do you know that the child, him or herself, um, is actually uh, having an advantage right. from your investment? So a couple of ways. Um, we do rely on the field doing research and saying that when the field researches itself, not just us, that these types of interventions are effective. And there are studies that show that when you have an effective uh, ECE classroom or family child care, that the child is ready for learning in kindergarten. And what makes an effective classroom or, or family child care home? There are these you know, parameters that we work with. But that's quite abstract, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you basically are saying research shows that if you do this, it'll get better. So therefore we're gonna do a lot of this. Right. How right. do you make sure that, that the assumption is correct? We constantly test it. So there are some real time examples as well. So LAUSD is a good example. We, which we work very closely with them to see how um, our, our improvement plans are working with their whole system and if they're seeing the gains that they wanna see. And also Linwood uh, Unified School District is a great example. Um, about 10 or 11 years ago, they made um, the uh, decision to invest quite heavily in their early care and education. And now about 10 or 11 years later, as those children are matric matriculating through their system, Linwood has uh, been acknowledged for having had dramatic increases in their graduation rates in high school, their literacy rates in third grade. We're not saying we were the sole cause of it, but we do believe that it is part of a, a systemic approach to this issue and that um, the, the having a quality early in the education system has a, a major impact on now, it. Now, sometimes when organizations come in as partners, mm -hmm. there is a criticism that, that can be leveled that really what's going on is simply this. We are starved for resources in our school district. This is just another resource. More resources, better than less resource. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what's really happening is we're just investing more per, per child and uh, really you should just give us, give us the money mm -hmm. um, and then we'll invest more per child. Um, how do you feel about, about that kind of uh, formulation? And, and is there really an issue that's, that's mostly about resources or is this the kind of thing where uh, certain structures, a public school structure does certain things better and then the, the partner who, is, uh, who has a, a different perspective, different funding and so on, can do their things better and together they, they better serve the children. What, which of those uh, arguments do you think has the most merit? They sway back and forth right. and it depends on the system. There are a lot of really um, compelling arguments to say that this area is just so starred with resources. Yes, just put it in, let the folks who are doing the work benefit from it and, and go from there. Um, but we have seen that kids who participate in programs that we've been able to affect change in, they do better than even the peers who were in programs of the same system, but didn't have the benefits of a, of a Child360 um, coaching system. So we know that it has an impact on those kids. Our work with these systems is to build capacity. Ideally, um, as in the K through 12 system, it would be great if teachers had much more in the ECE world. It'd be great if those teachers had a much more um, long lasting and, and established coaching mentoring system. We know that with teachers, with education, coaching and mentoring works. It works in K through 12. The systems that have embraced it do well. Our, our challenge is to have them view the ECE workforce just as the K through 12 workforce. They're, they're, they're doing the same types of works in sometimes even more challenging environments. So the need for that coaching and mentoring is even greater. The impact is greater too, but the need is even greater. So we work with these partners to say, how can we help you do that? If it's not us for the long term, that's fine. But how can we build your capacity to continue that work? Bill Sperling, thank you so much for describing this unique approach taken by Child360, the wonderful work that you do, your philosophy, the, the work of your people and your board, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.